coming up. Another podcast. Brilliant way of putting it. That, to me, makes the biggest change in the way that you read it. So I did too much. Interesting. Well, you know me, I'm more of a sledgehammer than a light touch, but I'll give it a go. <laughs> You're always doing less, less, less. There was a melancholy feel to that. This is weird what your brain does. Empathetic rather than emotive. That's a really good way of, of thinking about it, actually. And now, enjoy the podcast. How do you say that? How do you say that? How do you say that? How How do do you say say that? that? Hello and welcome to today's episode of How Do You Say That? Sponsored by BritishVoiceOver.co.uk The podcast for voiceovers, podcasters and anyone else who reads scripts out loud Proving there isn't just one way to read a script But a multitude of different (laughs) ways So let me introduce my co-host, Mark Rice Hello Hello, Mark. <laughs> Hello. Now, t- today's fun fact about Mark is, it's a bit of an insight. Mm. He should wear glasses all yeah. the time, but he's too vain. I am too vain to wear glasses all the time. I have to wear them <laughs> for reading. I, I, There are about 10 different pairs of glasses, reading glasses, in wow. my house, in, really? in all the different rooms. Uh, I don't need them for driving, so I kind of kid myself that I don't need them all the time. Mm-hmm. That's my story. Anyway. I see. I see. <laughs> well, my co-host is Sam Boffin, who loves cheese and loves fudge. But you don't like getting them muddled up, do you, Sam? No, I don't. And the only reason I'm even even going here with this cheese fudge thing, <laughs> you have to understand them in context, I think. And one, one year at some local country fair, my sister gave me a piece of fudge. Right. And I thought she'd given me a piece of cheese. Oh, <laughs> right. Ah, so your mouth was not expect. Oh, no. yeah. No, so I bit into the fudge. Oh, well, I bit into the cheese, expecting it to be fudge, and oh. um, it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever. Yes, your brain does something really weird. At that it's point, really weird, it? isn't it? <laughs> and yet, as soon as I realised it was fudge, it was delicious. I wanted more. <laughs> so it's weird what your brain does. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we also have a special guest who this week is voice actor. Helen Lloyd. Hello, Helen. Hello, Helen. Good evening. My brain does weird things all the time. (laughs) Mine does too. (laughs) Not just with fudge and cheese. It's just generally made out of cotton wool, I think. (laughs) I'm sure not. So, and in fact, you'll believe that even less when you hear what Helen has got up to. So Helen has worked at most of the UK's major repertory theatres, playing everything from ladies in waiting to major roles, including the lead, this is so cool, the lead in The Mousetrap in year 29 in the West End. Amazing. (laughs) She was also a presenter and announcer with ITV and then she moved into production and made documentaries as well as narrating over 50 documentaries for ITV. Amazing. Well, after redundancy, she starred in the award-winning short film Gerald's Best Client, was a medical secretary for a few years and rediscovered audiobooks in 2013. Helen has now narrated over 150 audiobooks, including several earphone award winners, and she's had an Audi nomination. Amazing, Helen. Have you got a fun fact that you can share with us? I once flew as a fairy. Oh. Oh, on stage. Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes, it wasn't so nice. Um, I was playing the good fairy in in an adaptation of The Wizard of Oz, right. and I was being flown. And being flown is incredibly uncomfortable. You have Ooh. this kind of harness that strapped up. Yes, yeah, you know. And then and then somebody hoists you in the air and you fly. But the trouble with this particular day was that the person who was doing the flying who was actually a very small guy. He was actually the elephant keeper at Chester Zoo. This is how <laughs> random it gets. Wow. Um, <laughs> In order to get me off the ground, and I am i was a considerably lighter then than I am now, but still no lightweight, he had to jump off a chair. And so right. he'd stand in the wings, he'd jump off the chair, I'd go up into the air, and then I'd gracefully fly across oh, the stage. Oh, I love it. Yeah, except that on this particular day, somebody had stolen the chair. Oh, no. So he, oh, he put himself to his full length, stretched upwards, pulled the rope. I went to jump, and I... Flew. I lifted my feet off the ground, but I yeah. made my entrance with my nose parallel to the floor and about six <laughs> inches above it. Oh, I can picture uh, it now. That's amazing. <laughs> yes, in a blonde wig, dressed as a fairy. Very inelegant. <laughs> lovely, lovely entrance for the fairy. Yes, so, very good. <laughs> so let's have a look at our first script of the show and ask, how do you say that? Play, how do you say that? 
So this is something that I've been working on relatively recently. Mm-hmm. It's for a client, and I also host a podcast for the same client. Another podcast? Another podcast. <laughs> How is that Fair. possible? <laughs> so, but this was more, yes, this is more of an audio guide. So more of an audio guide. Uh, who, yeah. is it, who is it um, to? Who, who's the audience for this? Well, I suppose the audience are people who they are hoping will become volunteers. Right. Okay, so members of the public. Yes, and members of this particular club that I am, yeah, that I that I'm kind of making the audio guide for. So and yes, it's 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 public facing, but also I- internal, as it were. And is it more presentery in that respect if it is for the people that you make a podcast for, or not this particular thing? Well, I have to say, I'm not very presentery on the podcast. I, I'm, <laughs> okay, not, I'm not wildly okay. presentery at all. So I, I definitely didn't make this presentery. Right. Um, so uh, it was much more of a conversational piece. Any questions that you'd like to ask before we all have a go at it, Helen? No, it's interesting that you ask that you talk about who the end client is, because mm. that to me makes the biggest change in the way that you mm. read it. Of course, because yeah. in a way, you're trying to sell it to them. Yeah. But it's very difficult to, to do that without sounding patronising or yeah. overly overly yeah. enthusiastic. You, it's, it's that balance between sounding encouraging and positive and not sounding too kind of, oh, aren't we all wonderful? Yes, particularly for this, I agree with you. Yeah. So, it, yeah. yes, it needs to be quite a light touch in that sense, yeah. Well, you know me, I'm more of a sledgehammer than a light touch, <laughs> but I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right. Let's let's see what I can pull out of this one then. Here we go. Volunteering makes a real difference in local communities. Volunteers respond to real-time needs and deliver valuable financial, social and cultural benefits to millions of people, projects and causes. Whether working as individuals or as in groups, volunteers are the essence of local communities. And this can be especially important during challenging times, when the usual rhythm and flow of community life is disrupted. This audio guide is divided into six short sections that celebrate the value of local community volunteering and how you can get involved. Nice. Yeah. Very friendly. Yeah, very positive. Yeah, absolutely. Did you go down a notch because I said not presentary? Yes. Although I think it, yes, I think yes. I, I think it still was quite presentary, actually. <laughs> it was more probably more presentary than yeah, mm. m- yeah. But, I, but but possibly you could have warmed it up. Um, yes, I, I probably should have smiled more. I think I realised that after people, projects, and causes, because it's got that horrible thing, hasn't it? That it's got a list, 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 and a list, list, list. I think Sam's right. I think warming it up would have given it um, a greater. Empathy, a greater connection to people. Um, I, I agree, the lists are a nightmare because there are so many of them. Yeah. And it's finding a way to do them without, A, without running out of breath. Yep. Um, but B, without without them sounding like lists. I know. And yes. I don't think I quite got that. I think it's it's the idea is to make them sound like they're new ideas. Like this yes. is the first time you're saying it ever yep. to anybody. And then it stops sounding like a list. I think it's interesting, of course, because on the podcast, we only do the first read and a director would come back and go, oh, yeah. can I have that a bit warmer or whatever? No, absolutely. So, so it's, it, we, we always kind of uh, mm. have, that, have that issue with the first read, but you make excellent points there, Helen. Would you like to have a bash? I'll have a go. OK. Volunteering makes a real difference in local communities. Volunteers respond to real-time needs and deliver valuable financial, social and cultural benefits to millions of people, projects and causes. Whether working as individuals or in groups, volunteers are the essence of local communities. And this can be especially important during challenging times, when the usual rhythm and flow of community life is disrupted. This audio guide is divided into six short sections that celebrate the value of local community volunteering and how you can get involved. Oh, I loved that. Oh, the warmth yeah. there, Helen, was... I mean, it, it, it practically warmed me up. I was practically warming my hands on it <laughs> yeah. as, as we went along. I love that. There's something very... Oh, what's the word? Traditional. And I want yeah. to say Valerie Singleton-esque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Traditional. In a, yes. And I mean that as a massive compliment. Yeah. I think there's an old-fashioned style of delivery yep. 
that is completely out of fashion at the moment and is not at all Agreed. Uh, in use, which is why I never get any work in this sort of area at all, <laughs> Fair. Okay. ever. But I do think that for some genres of work, it, it makes people feel safe and comfortable. Yes, yes, that's the word, safe. Yes, very much, yeah. Yep. When, you, when you're asking for people to come in and volunteer in the or charity be sector, involved yes. in something yeah. in the charity sector, then having that feeling of safety is really important. And I know it's not fashionable and I know it's not, you know, it's not current and it sounds old-fashioned. But I think when you're doing this sort of text, it's the... I just yeah. feel it feels to me a very strong way to do it um, because it it does. It, it's that feeling of comfort and safety and dependability and credibility yeah. that I think is important. What I particularly loved about that, Helen, was the, the pace was just gorgeous because it, it yeah. everything landed right, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I took in every single bit of information, yep. which is exactly because this was you know, this is after, you know, unsettling times, basically, yeah. they're wanting to reassure yeah. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Sam, let's have a let's have a listen to the way that you did it then. OK, I'll just have a little bit of tea. <laughs> Volunteering makes a real difference in local communities. Volunteers respond to real time needs and deliver valuable financial, social and cultural benefits to millions of people, projects and causes. Whether working as individuals or in groups, volunteers are the essence of local communities. And this can be especially important during challenging times when the usual rhythm and flow of community life is disrupted. This audio guide is divided into six short sections that celebrate the value of local community volunteering and how you can get involved. There was real warmth there as well, yeah. it, just in a different way to the way that oh, Helen yeah. did it. That's interesting. Oh. It's really difficult, isn't it? Because you know that the, the, the people who are listening to this are going to be of dif different ethnicities, mm -hmm. yep. different ages, yep. with different accents, with yep. different backgrounds. And it's finding something that, that doesn't exclude any of those yeah, people. Yeah, it has to land yes. with all of them. And I yes. think I think Sam's more youthful, more less slightly formal delivery than mine yeah. Yeah. works better for a wider number of people. I think mine would be the the old, you know, the retired person who's thinking, would I feel safe going mm -hmm. down there to volunteer? That yeah. would be my voice. But Sam's is going to get a more youthful generation and a much wider uh, age group and ethnicity than mine would. Agreed. And that's why Sam has got this job and I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is doing this, the tone needs to be uh, the right kind of inviting, mm. Um, mm. you know, reassuring. It's got to be inclusive, hasn't it? It's yes. got to be inclusive. Absolutely. And that's a really difficult thing to do when you've got a fairly formal text. Yeah. Well, it's worthwhile remembering that these are real scripts that we're working on, but we've changed names and some of the details to avoid copyright issues. So, Helen, you've bought, and it's a very difficult thing to bring, a tiny moment in an audio book. So can you, can you tell us a bit more about this particular one? Right. Well, the background to this story is that Nora is an old lady mm -hmm. and she's sitting in her living room window uh, watching uh, two children playing on the street uh, mm -hmm. on their bicycles. And one of the children, well, there's a boy and a girl, and the boy reminds her of a child that she knew when she was a little girl, oh. who right. was, was George, this, this boy called George. Yep. Mm -hmm. And George gave her for her... 14th birthday or something, a young birthday, mm. early teen birthday, a thimble. Ah, and okay. it was, yeah, so he gave her the thimble. And she is now in her 80s. Mm -hmm. And she's watched these children out in the street. And she's just watching them and remembering George. So for something like this, the context, what's What's certainly what's come before is yes. so important. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So important. Yeah, you do, yeah. Uh, we needed that to be able to. Yes, yes because make otherwise sense it's it. it's just an it's just a piece of prose, mm. slightly poetic prose. It doesn't yep. have any it doesn't have any resonance, yeah. which is why. Uh, I, and I mean that's the whole point. That's why I love doing audiobooks, is because you don't have a thirty second instant hit. You mm -hmm. have 
10 hour hit yeah. where you know where something starts and develops and builds and you have the chance to get your head and your heart inside the characters that you And I have playing. to say that's why I love listening to audiobooks yeah. but I don't actually do them because I th- I think m- I'm I am much more down the other end of the scale but I take my hat off to any narrator that that does audiobooks It is a a very specialist thing. The yes. skills, the skills for audiobooks are quite, quite different. I yep. think yep. from Agreed. from from doing other voiceover work. Right, Sam. I think yes. you ought to have a go at, at this little snippet mm-hmm. from from this book. It's a lovely, <coughs> lovely piece. Okay. Nora closes her eyes, and inhales the memory of George. Palm olive soap, fresh air, and boy. Her fingers remember his backbone beneath his thin cotton shirt, like a line of cobblestones, a washboard of ribs on either side. His breath warm against her cheek, his auburn hair tangling with her lighter curls. If she and George had had a son, he'd have looked just like that boy. That beautiful boy, out there on his bicycle. Nora fingers the old wooden thimble in her cardigan pocket. Smoothed by years of her caress, the heart and flower are almost undetectable. It... it creates a really emotional response doesn't it and you can and yeah, it does. And, and and that's the that's the lovely thing uh, there was a melancholy feel to that oh, was there mm. yes no a nice one it made me feel good you know sometimes when you when you have a melancholy feeling it 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 it, it stirs up a lot of emotion i liked that yes it was very interesting hearing you read it because it was very clear that you are used to finding the if you like the buzzwords in a copy Yep. Uh, Which is what you have to do in, in commercials. Yeah. You 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 stressed, you use stress and emphasis really beautifully. And I think this is the biggest difference between doing an audiobook copy and doing commercial copy. Right. Is that the, is that you will find the words and play you'll play the words mm-hmm. for their texture and their tone. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what you do in a in a commercial read. Mm-hmm. You know, if this was an advert for palm olive soap, yes, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Everything that you did would have been, was perfect, but I think in an audio book, you're always doing less, 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 and less. So, so I did yeah. too much. Interesting. Yeah, I yeah, think slightly absolutely. too much because I think in an audio book, what you're doing is you're allow- what you're doing is you're putting the thought into the listener's head. So that they imagine rather than you imagining. Right. You were imagining it. You were imagining it beautifully. Yes. I'm and I could see it all happening. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was it yeah, was yeah. there. It was in your voice. I've never heard it put that way before, Helen, but that's a beautifully brilliant way of putting it. Yeah. It, it, it What you want to do is draw the listener in and say, I'm opening a door for you. Close your eyes and you see it. Yes. Not me see it if that makes sense yeah no it does it's fascinating <laughs> i'm really scared now oh, no, don't <laughs> be, don't don't be be. Scared. i'm really scared now just remember what you're doing is you are telling the story that is your role as a narrator of an audiobook that yep. is yeah. your only role is to tell the story and allow the listener to employ their imagination their oh. vision that is what you are doing. You are transmitting fact and allowing them through pause, pace, pitch, vocal tone to come into the world that you're creating. You're not chucking it at them. You're bringing them in. Yeah. Is it flatter, do you think? I don't know whether flat is the right word. I think it's empathetic rather than emotive. That's a really good way of, yeah. of thinking about it, actually. Off you go, Mark. You'll be great. Let, let me give it a try. Nora closes her eyes and inhales the memory of George. Palm olive soap, fresh air, and boy. Her fingers remember his backbone beneath his thin cotton shirt, like a line of cobblestones, a washboard of ribs on either side. His breath warm against her cheek, his auburn hair tangling with her lighter curls. 
If she and George had had a son, he'd have looked just like that boy, that beautiful boy out there on his bicycle. Nora fingers the old wooden thimble in her cardigan pocket. Smoothed by years of her caress, the heart and flower are almost undetectable. That was lovely. That was really nice. <laughs> yeah. That's what I meant when I said flatter. You yeah. did flatten it. You did. Yes. And di very, very deliberately after that discussion. Yes. But what was interesting is you flattened across the whole thing. Yeah. And you didn't give, you didn't use pause hardly at all. Mm. And pause in audiobook is your friend of because course. it allows you to do all the changes. This is moment by moment, you know. Mm -hmm. This is the first thing. This is the next thing. This is the third thing. Yeah. And each of those sentences is a new thought and a new moment. And if you don't use pause in between, you're not allowing the, the moment to settle and the, the listener to go, yeah, the breath, the hair. The yeah. bicycle. So it's allowing the it's allowing the time to pass. It, it's painting the picture with time involved in it. So pause is a really really interesting thing because you don't get chance to pause very much in corporate or in or anything else. Reads no, at indeed, all, in anything indeed. else. Mm. But if you don't pause in audiobooks, you the sense of it is diminished and it becomes very. Um, much more difficult to listen to. I'm not suggesting great barn doors of pauses. No, I appreciate And the pauses that. have to have to be meaningful. But pause is a is your friend in audiobooks, and it isn't in any other form of audio, really. Sam, that's yeah. masterclass in in a paragraph, really, isn't it? It is. Oh, brilliant, 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 <laughs> uh, lovely. Uh, Helen, I am I am fascinated to to hear how you how you would do it. <laughs> God, now I'm really on the spot. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Nora closes her eyes and inhales the memory of George. Palm olive soap, fresh air, and boy. Her fingers remember his backbone beneath his thin cotton shirt, like a line of cobblestones, a washboard of ribs on either side. His breath warm against her cheek his auburn hair tangling with her lighter curls. If she and George had had a son, he'd have looked just like that boy, that beautiful boy out there on his bicycle. Nora fingers the old wooden thimble in her cardigan pocket. Smoothed by years of her caress, the heart and flower are almost undetectable. I see what you mean about the pauses. Absolutely. Yeah, gorgeous. yeah and, and you bring it home and, and uh, it makes such perfect sense having heard you do it. Good. Yeah, definitely. It, but it is, but it, you know, I didn't do anything that different from what Sam did or what you did in terms of the read. You know, <clears throat> the stresses were almost, almost identical mm. because those are where the stresses are written. You know, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, they're where you have to stress. But it's the it's the change of thought with every new sentence. It's yeah. the change of moment and that those little tiny gaps in between. And having the courage to go slowly. Yes. Yes. And I, and I think I'm a long way away from that. If you assume that you can do everything, you're going to end up not actually doing anything very well. Yeah. Everybody yep. has got their own, you know, you play to your strengths. Indeed. Yep. Indeed. And and your strength is 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 very different from my strength. How do you say that? Well, now here's the moment that we love the wild card bit. Let's see if we can approach these scripts in a completely different way. Helen, can you pick one of the scripts for Sam and give her a character and an action or a motivation that goes with it? Right. Uh Sam, I'd like you to read the thimble piece. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I'd like you to read it as a a dirty old woman. <laughs> Ooh. So a kind of predatory typecast there, Sam, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, sir. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> a predatory ex hooker. Ooh. Oh. Right? Yes. Who is who is sitting with a fag in her mouth, right. looking Good. out at the window at these kids playing in the street. 
Right. And okay. and planning the seduction of this young boy. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. So, so really, I mean, yeah, kind. And you could, I mean, if you want to use an accent, feel free to use an yep. accent. But okay. really sort of turn it on its head and yes. make it, you know, make it complete dirty and, and mm, okay. unpleasant and sinister. Lovely. All right, then. Nora closes her eyes and inhales the memory of George. <laughs> Palm olive soap. Fresh air and... Oh, boy. Her fingers remember his backbone beneath his thin cotton shirt like a line of cobblestones. <laughs> a washboard of ribs on either side. Oh, his breath warm against her cheek is... His open hair tangling with her lighter curls. Oh, yeah. If she and George had had a son, he'd look just like that boy. <laughs> that beautiful boy out there on his bicycle. Nora fingers the old wooden thimble in her cardigan pocket. Smoothed by years of her caress, that heart and flower, they're almost undetectable. Oh, that was wonderful. It, it really was. It really was. <laughs> and, she, and and that unpleasantness that we talked about was at its very core. I wonder if I could have gone further. I should, maybe could have gone further. I would have probably gone further if I'd done it again. But it, it was it was really interesting having to change my vis- vision, if you like. Having yes, to change yes, what yes, I yes. was yes. thinking yeah. about. Yeah, how... it, was, it, was, it was very Fagin. Yes, it, <laughs> yes, was. it was a bit. Yes, it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> right, boys. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, it was. It was. And I think that accent worked. Yes, I do too. I do too. And you made the thimble sound like something really sinister. <laughs> yes, she did. You know, as, if it was, she, yes. as if it contained poison or something. It was really clever. That was really good. I really enjoyed that. Oh, good. <laughs> right, well, Helen, I'm going to suggest one for you now. And oh, right. you gave okay. me an idea with your fun fact about the fairy that fell flat and didn't really and didn't didn't really fly across the stage. So I think Script one, so the volunteering script, it kind of goes in with fairy. I think, yes, let's play good fairy, but good clumsy fairy. (laughs) And possibly good clumsy fairy realising that she's in the wrong place entirely. (laughs) You swine. I knew I should never have agreed to this. I think you'll be brilliant. Okay. All right. Volunteering makes a real difference in local communities. Volunteers respond to real-time needs and deliver valuable financial, social and cultural benefits to millions of people, projects and causes. Whether working as individuals or in groups, volunteers are the essence of local communities. (laughs) And this can be especially important during challenging times when the usual rhythm and flow of community life is disrupted. This audio guide is divided (laughs) into six short sections that celebrate the value of local community volunteering and how you can get involved. Bye! (laughs) I totally spotted that pivot where you realised you were in the wrong place. (laughs) Loved the pivot. (laughs) That was lovely. (laughs) Because so actually, good. it was quite a rounded fairy in that first in that first sentence, and you go, "Oh, this is nice," and then you the the, the, the smashing realization happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Wait, the set. What? Nobody loves a fairy when she's forty. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> loves a fairy when she's old. How do you say that? Well, if you want to play along in the privacy of your own booths, we've put the scripts in the show notes so you can have a try yourselves. Yes, you absolutely can. And our question for Helen this week is, so I'm fascinated by this because you've had, Helen, such a varied career and yeah. all of it, bar a strange medical secretary moment, but anyway, <laughs> bar, oh, most of it is, has, has all been in the arts, the theatre and media. So what is it about audiobooks in particular that attracted you as opposed to 
all the other gazillion areas of voiceover. I mean, you know, audio drama, say, or... I have done audio drama in the past, ah, and I have I done say, video I games so. as well. Ah, okay. um, what I like best about audiobooks is the fact you get to play all the parts. So ah, it's all the things that nice. you never thought you could ever do. So, yeah. I mean, I have done books where I have aged from 12, the same character, from the age of 12 to the age of 80. Wow. Wow. In one book. Yeah. And that isn't something you ever get to do in anything else. It's also, it's like being a lazy actor. And not that one is being lazy being an audiobook narrator. It's very not at all. No. complicated. But yeah. I don't have to go on tour. I don't have to pack live out of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't have to be in drafty theatres with, you know, horrible theatrical digs. Um, <laughs> and I can do all of that and play all the parts, you yeah. know, in every single book. Well, most of the books you end up doing all of them, and most of them are still solo narration, although yes. increasingly there are, there, you know, there are multi-voice things as well. Um, and, and it's just the best fun that you can have while sitting in a padded room talking to yourself. <laughs> of the 150 titles that you have done audiobooks for, do you have an absolute favourite somewhere? Usually the last one I did. <laughs> um, I think that might be the cheats tactful. answer. <laughs> I think there are two that I really, really enjoyed the most. Uh, one was a comedy and the other was very definitely a tragedy. Um, and those, I think, were the two, because they were the two extremes of emotion, really. Um, one was called How the Penguins Saved Veronica. Right. Um, that was the one I got already nominated for. And I loved it because it's an, a, an old, curmudgeonly old lady. And it's just lovely. And she was such fun to be. And the other one is a book called The First Time I Held You, which is about a woman who gives up a child for adoption and spends the whole of her life wondering what has happened to that child and eventually reconnects with the child's father and her child's daughter, so her granddaughter. But nobody knows that it's her granddaughter until the very end. And that's, oh. that was a wonderful book to read. Those two, I think, are probably my favourites. Amazing. Well, well, the other thing, of course, we didn't mention, Helen, is that you, you coach in audiobooks. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I mean, I didn't ever intend to, um, but that it just people asked me because I think because I my background of acting and also teach because I I taught I was head of learning at Derby Theatre for a good few years, ah. um, so I did quite a lot of work with with students and community groups as well as helping and supporting and also teaching audiobook narrators when when really in the UK working remotely first became a thing yeah but people were yeah. saying how what do you do how do you do it so I started coaching um, and I still do I don't coach beginners I coach people with a with a portfolio yep. already and I either do one-to-one -one director sessions if yep. people want to work on individual texts or audition pieces or whatever or mm. I do a full sort of in detail six part written distance learning thing as well. And a reminder that all of Helen's details can be found in the show notes. Yes, Helen, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And it was great hearing your interpretations. <laughs> well, thank you. That's oh, kind. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. We'll also be putting today's scripts in the show notes so you can have a read yourself at home. Yes, absolutely. And please do like and subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And feel free to give us a review if you feel like you need to. <laughs> We'd love that. Uh, OK, that's it for this week. Thanks again to Helen Lloyd. And we'll be back next week with more scripts and another voiceover guest where we'll be asking... How, how do you, do you say, say that? that? How do you say that? How do you say that? that?